Well, thank you all for coming. Can uh, can everyone hear me in the back? And is this a good kind of volume? Yeah. All right. So uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I'm going to present today on a note, the slightly different title. This is preparations for thrust measurement of this cavity. So there's always a aspirational element to writing an abstract uh, far in advance of a talk like this. And then, you know, the perspiration of actually uh, putting it together. And, and to be fair, that desperation at the end as you look at how you've accomplished a little less than you anticipated and pull it all together into a coherent whole. So uh, we're going to, we don't have any thrust measurements from one of these cavities yet. We are instead going to talk about essentially the governing philosophy of how we're designing the experiment and what we want to accomplish. So I certainly didn't know most of you uh, before I got here. I still honestly don't know many of you. And I'll do you the courtesy of assuming you don't know who I am either. Uh, my name is Michael McDonald. I work at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC. And I have a background in Hall thruster experimental testing. So I got my PhD from Michigan in 2011 under Alec Gallimore, working with large Hall thrusters and electron transport physics in the plasma. I came to NRL in 2012. Uh, I've been there now for about five years, uh, a couple of that as a postdoctoral fellow, and then the remaining three as a member of the technical staff and PI on investigative programs. So what I'm going to go through today is uh, an overview of what the impulse program is at NRL, uh, walk you through our different pieces of experimental equipment that we'll be using to do the testing, uh, give a kind of thrust of our overall experimental plans, which are really just getting into high gear now. And as far as results, I'm only going to be presenting initial thermal test results. This is basically checkouts of our test devices, looking at thermal profiling, how hot they get, making sure we can resonate everything properly. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with, uh, with a little discussion of the types of errors that I'm going to be looking for. And uh, that's about it. So. So first, uh, I'm going to explain what NRL is briefly for everyone's benefit. It was uh, certainly something I learned a lot about getting to the organization. So it's a top line, billion dollar level uh, institution. Uh, we're based in Washington, DC. Unlike the Air Force Research Laboratories you may be familiar with that are spread through centers across the US, everything for NRL is under one roof. So we've got chemistry, vacuum electronics, optical sciences, nanoscience institute, uh, acoustics, all those divisions, as well as my own division, the Naval Center for Space Technology, uh, live on the same campus. We have about 3,000 people, um, 1,600 or so scientists and engineers, about half those are PhDs. And at, and at the NCST in particular, uh, we both do cradle to grave spacecraft design all the way up to operations, as well as basic research. And this program falls under the basic research. So impulse uh, is a little bit of a backronym for us here. It's the in-depth measurement of propulsion, or performance, excuse me, in unconventional, emphasis on the unconventional, low thrust spacecraft engines. And as a result, we've kind of lumped together a bunch of different, what are in many respects still kind of speculative classes of propulsion into a category of impulse drives. And uh, in particular, these resonant cavities uh, but also the, the mock effect devices that we've seen people talk about today. My you know, official position on the various theories that are put forth to explain these devices is that I'm just agnostic. Um, I don't really know, and at this point I don't really feel like I understand the data well enough to be able to judge accurately. You know, it's, and I've called them impulse drives because this is a picture of you know, the NASA test result. They, they call theirs a Q thruster because their theory is that it's quantum vacuum fluctuation related. Um, Scheuer in the UK calls his device an EM drive because he claims it's electromagnetic in its origins. Uh, you know, the Mach effect thrusters obviously claim a variation in inertial mass. And I didn't really want the naming that we give to these devices to imply any particular favorite among the theories. You know, we just don't have one, we're agnostic. The motivation why NRL is doing this is, um, well, you know, the Navy likes to talk to its ships. And so once upon a time that was, that was radar and uh, bouncing things off the ionosphere. And we still have a very strong legacy program in plasma physics and ionospheric physics uh, and NRL uh, as a result of that. But, you know, over the past 50 years, that's, that's space. Space is part of the environment in which we operate. And so when we're in space, propulsion reaction mass is, is a tyrant. The rocket equation, it limits everything we can do. 
And the idea that NASA put out this peer-reviewed test result that you could get thrust with no apparent propellant from a, a, a closed box, a resonant microwave cavity, uh, is, is pretty extraordinary. So you know, this is just a picture of some of their data. You can see the error bars are, are substantial. Uh, but you know, the test results are peer-reviewed. And I don't know how many of you have done peer reviews for journals and things like that. But to me, peer review doesn't necessarily mean right. Uh, that's not that's not what we say. It means it's it's credible. It means that there was no real smoking gun that the peers identified. It's not immediately obvious why it's wrong. Uh, it's a good faith effort, and it's a good starting point on which the community can build. And so, when I look at those results, I don't have anything bad to say about the NASA Johnson presentation or test data they've put forth. I think it's a good first step, and we're going to go and try and improve it and make it better. You know, and as I consider that experimental setup, uh, which I assume many of you are already familiar with, uh, you know, thermal drift is really one of the big ones. That's everyone has their own biggest fear when they look at an experimental setup. And it's always dictated on what your worst problems have been in the past. But for me, it's it's thermal drift that leaps out here. So our objectives in this program are to first replicate the NASA cavity geometry. So with our own design, our own mechanical RF thermal, everything, but take their basic internal resonant geometry and just duplicate that so that we start from the same frequency and presumably the same physics, whether that is some new physics or it's one of the many things that's already in a textbook somewhere through some sort of experimental error. Uh, we're going to meet or exceed. I think at present we'll probably exceed a little bit the 80 watt forward power, and we certainly designed to go well above that if we can. And most importantly for me is to operate at thermal steady state rather than these kind of quick tests where you have to turn on and off to keep everything cool. And so I'll walk through how we're going to do that and what those thermal profiles look like. Um, I only have about 15 or 20 slides, so with any luck this won't be you know, an hour. This should be a little bit shorter. So as far as our experimental equipment goes, I'll walk through many of these in a little more detail in the next few slides. Uh, but briefly, we, we test on a torsional thrust stand. Uh, right now, you know, less than three micronewton resolution. That, that's a moving target number. Everyone defines it a little differently. You know, it's, it's also a little different day to day and test condition to test condition. But when we quote this number, we typically mean an RMS uh, oscillation in the force value that we measure. And that's after you try to account as best you can for things like thermal drift. So Mike, what, what was the heritage of that stand as far as, uh, was that something custom built for this program? Or do you uh, I'm, actually, I'm gonna talk, talk more a little bit in the next slide, but it started out as a BUSIC system. Um, right. you know, we, we bought one and it was for another program and we kind of optimized it pretty heavily in-house. Okay, thank you. It was cheap. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing it over here just to note that the cavity is, uh, is large, certainly for this thrust stand that we work with, but it's feasible. Uh, our actual resonant cavity test article you see here, uh, this replicates the dimensions as I noted. Uh, it has a high Q factor at the uh, about 1.9 gigahertz. Our vacuum facility, I won't talk about much more in the next few slides, so I'll address now that uh, we're a little bit uh, a little bit less ideal than I think Martin's setup, which has this beautiful giant concrete slab and is very well isolated. So the south chamber where we do our testing uh, is related to where the thrust stand started, Greg, that you're asking about. It's primarily used uh, before this program started for resistor jet testing and really for optimizing low Reynolds number flows for really small resistor jets. And as a result, most resistor jet testing happens with light species, hydrogen species typically. So we run it on this south chamber because it has a really big diffusion pump. Uh, that's, that's the actual, I think it's maybe 25,000 liter per second. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a 48 inch NRC diffusion pump with nominal like 50 or 100,000 liters. And that's really the loss after you get through the thermal baffles for the chamber. So the thrust stand is kind of really built into the base of that chamber now, so we're not going to move it. But the chamber is, uh, it's large, you know, so it's about eight feet diameter, maybe 12 feet tall, and it's suspended in the superstructure of our building. So, so it's built in, you know, the I-beams of the building are supporting it. There's people's offices right next door. They recline in their chair and the thing kind of vibrates. So the vibration isolation for the stand was, was quite tricky. Um, and that's what a lot of our initial development went into. Uh, we live at a base pressure of about 10 to the minus 6 torr for our thrust stand. One of the nice peculiarities of this class of device is that our base pressure is also our operating pressure. So uh, not having to use reaction mass and propellant will do that for you. 
And uh, as far as the RF circuitry goes, uh, right now we're running off 150 watt amplifiers uh, between 700 megahertz and two and a half gigahertz. Uh, we designed the system for 500 watt throughput. That doesn't mean it will live to 500 watts. It means that I'm not immediately sure what component would break if we put it up to 500 watts. Uh, we use closed loop resonant feedback control on the cavity. And we, uh, I'll talk quite a bit more about this idea of a non-contact joint that we use to get the RF power in the system. Mike, how are you doing your closed feedback loop? Uh, you mean what, what are we monitoring are basically? Are you doing a PLL or are you doing... No? Uh, it, it's basically a dither. So uh, you monitor reflected power and you just you know, take a step forward and back every time step. Is it better or worse? If it's worse, go the other way. And you, so you end up stepping back and forth around the minimum. Yeah, the, you, you can't really do a, usually I would do a PID loop uh, if I wanted to control something, but there you need a negative error to compensate for. And here, your minimum of your reflected power is, is zero. So you never get a negative uh, for a PID loop type feedback. And phase lock looping is, um, my impression is that it is kind of a DAC intensive process. You know, so the nice thing about watching the reflected power, the main thing that dictates that um, shifting that you get in resonant frequency is all thermal. So we run our control loop at maybe two, three hertz, um, and it locks on just fine. So I'm going to walk through the thrust stand in a little bit more detail. So that's the, really the centerpiece of doing these tests. Uh, this picture is a little bit old. Uh, the CAD models that we show later uh, show more accurately what our current setup looks like. But this is a semi-custom product we purchased from Busick back in 2013. So for those, most of you are probably familiar with Busick, but if you're not, they are a small, uh, very R&D heavy space propulsion company uh, where they uh, put up the first US hall thruster in space, the BHT-200. They do a lot of small propulsion development. In particular, they make some really world-class devices. And so this, this thruster is a very nice system of theirs. Uh, you'll note that this golden color, it's all iridated aluminum that's been dip brazed, so it has no thermal stresses in the assembly. You put it together. Uh, quite, quite happy with it. So we bought it in 2013 and had specced a noise floor of about 40 or 50 micronewtons, the exact number escapes me. And uh, we've refined over the past few years our system to the level where that's now at about two to five micronewtons. And that's mostly due to improvements in vibration isolation. So the centerpiece of it is this torsional arm and we have it sitting in this larger stand and it's connected through these little torsional pivots. So some of you may be familiar with these, they're flexures. The only joints between the inner and outer part of the cylinder is where these two crossbars meet in this cross section. So the idea is it's a very uh, stiction friction free kind of coupling that you get so the arm can turn. Uh, the types of displacement you get, uh, so we, you know, you have a little assembly to hold, I'll go back and forth, you have a little right here, assembly to hold the pivots in place and mount them, uh, and then clamps that let the wires get onto the arm itself, uh, if you need any for your test device. Uh, this picture actually has some propellant lines in it too, it's from resistor jet testing, but we obviously don't need those for our tests. And then this is the place where the optical sensor lives. So way over there, there's a mirror on the back side of that arm, the device under test usually lives on this arm, so this is displacement measured at the opposite arm. And the combination of that laser displacement sensor, uh, as well as uh, right here, this system, which you see from the side, these two plates for capacitive force generation let you do in situ calibration. So you button up the chamber, you pump down a vacuum, uh, you apply different voltages between uh, these plates and the gap. Uh, you get a potential energy that's one half CV squared, uh, do that configuration, you carefully measure all that out, and then a force is a derivative of a potential so you can get a force profile uh, that calibrates out the displacements required to move the arm a particular distance. So I had, uh, let's see, there's another point I want to make on this. Do you have any dampers on the arm? Ah, yeah, thank you for the lead in. So the last thing is uh, the damper. This is actually uh, the stock placement for Busick's dampers that they put in. I haven't updated the CAD model. The uh, dampers actually now, instead of having a plate here um, on this face of the arm, it actually hangs down underneath the capacitive plate. 
So it kind of rests down here, a little copper plate. And then we have some magnets on another one of these little stages that can move in and be adjusted. So that's a pretty recent addition uh, that we put on to be able to adjust the damping. And the thought was that you might be able to approach some kind of critical damping. Um, so when you, you put a voltage on the cap plates, you get a nice impulsive force and you can kind of see the thing ring down. And I expect we're still going to be over damped um, just because we're going to have a big heavy mass on this stand. And we use pretty small magnets. Um, so we typically overshoot and come back. Uh, so that is the thrust stand. I don't believe I talk about it much in this set of slides. The set of slides is um, actually transferred over from a conference we went to last month where we presented this preparatory work and also put out our you know, the accompanying paper. And at that conference, my colleague Logan Williams, who is also on uh, this program, is really the thrust stand expert of our effort. And he published a dedicated just paper talking about how you calibrate the stand, how you do the vibration isolation, how you do the error quantization. He's done a lot of detailed error propagation through the different measurement uh, components that you get. But in that, he'll, he noted that underneath this optical breadboard that the whole stand sits on, uh, oh, I should, should note we also do in situ inclination control with a couple inclinometers that live on the arm so we can keep everything level. And that all sits on this optical breadboard. So underneath this optical breadboard, uh, that's where the vibrations from the rest of the universe come in, which are problematic. It's, uh, it's really difficult to isolate those, especially in a vacuum chamber. And what we ended up selecting was a basically a commercial system from a company called Minus K, which we learned about because they made a lot of the dampers that were used for the James Webb testing at Johnson, where they suspend their whole chamber on these vibration dampers because they need to measure everything so accurately for that incredibly precise uh, telescope. And so they also make little systems, and we bought a little vacuum safe system. It's entirely passive. It's all springs and flexures and, and coupled, buckled beams inside. Uh, and it has a resonant frequency of between a half and one hertz. So it, it dampens out most of the high frequency stuff you'd have to worry about. And that, that is a big part of how we got down to two to five micronewtons from up near 40 in this chamber that lives cantilevered up on top of some I-beams with people walking all around at their offices nearby. So moving on from the thrust stand, this is our resonant cavity. Uh, it's in its pretty bare state. You'll see later that we, we put some uh, heaters and some emissive coatings on it, but this is kind of as fabricated. Uh, resonant feature-wise, the internal dimensions are taken from NASA, so 11 inches on the OD, large OD, sorry, large ID inside here. Nine, uh, six and a quarter inches on the small ID, and nine inches from front plate to back plate. I don't think I have a cross section in this presentation, but it's flat end plates. Uh, we just, again, we were taking the NASA point design. We didn't mess with any of the spherical end caps people have been talking about here. And you measure the Q uh, with a network analyzer. And from, as I understand it from my RF engineer, there's a couple different ways you can measure the Q. Um, he had done two. We got 16,000 and 17,000. I've quoted the average here. Uh, it's about 16,500 at the 1.88 gigahertz. Uh, this cavity, as we measured it, is empty. There's no piece of plastic in it right now. That'll probably change the Q slightly and the resonant frequency slightly. Uh, the construction is a two-piece uh, lid and bucket. So this, this base is just a big, huge chunk of aluminum that got CNC lathed out and then plated in copper to get a nice uh, conductive material for the skin depth. Uh, we did that. You know, I, Martin's cavity yesterday was beautiful. You know, you could shave uh, looking in that, that shiny cavity mirror. Um, I don't believe your half million Q value, but I do believe your lower high tens of many tens of thousands kind of number. It's, it's very pretty. Uh, we, we tried to make this fabrication as, as dumb as possible, honestly. We didn't want to make the perfect the enemy of the good in making our cavity. We wanted to get a good enough test device that we could attack all the error mechanisms. So this, this finish is kind of matte and rough. You know, you could look at it, um, but it, it's good enough. We, we got, I think the nominal NASA value was seven or 8,000 for this test condition. Uh, so we, we got quite a bit more than that, and we we're happy to call that acceptable. Uh, the total weight of this is about seven pounds, uh, plus the HDPE insert, which would make it maybe another pound beyond that. And let's see, what else should I comment on here? Uh, I'll note there are some holes that you see here. Uh, both the, there are holes on the back as well. Those serve two purposes for us. First, uh, they're intended to just make absolutely glaringly certain that when we test the device, it's easy to evacuate it so that all the air gets out easily uh, at vacuum. 
And second, they provide our mounting holes so that if we want to hold the uh, plastic pieces inside the cavity, we just put an alumina bolt uh, through several of these holes to secure onto the plastic and hold it in place if we need to. They are clocked, you'll note it's, here's the RF feed, and they're clocked at 45 degrees to that. That's such that they live in the null planes of the 212 mode that we're going to be testing. They're small enough, they shouldn't affect resonance regardless, but we thought we'd just be a little extra careful there. Um, this, the design positioning of this feed through is really all about versatility. We didn't necessarily optimize it for the TM212 mode. Uh, you'll actually notice it's on a little piece of um, extra piece of copper. And we can remove that entire feed and put on a new one. Uh, we can clock it differently if we want to excite TE versus TM modes. We can <coughs> tune the diameter of the loop inside to uh, get the coupling just right. And that's, that's intended along with some of our other RF feed features later, such that if we need to test this device at different modes, uh, different types of modes, different operating frequencies, we have that flexibility going forward. Uh, is that a type in connector, by the way? That is actually a TNC connector. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not, my, my, my RF guy really liked the TNC. I'm more actually familiar with N types from a lot of the plasma work that I would do with RF sources, but. We wanted to do 500 watts, so. It, it, I, I did tell him that, and I, that may be why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he certainly trusts those a whole lot more than he did. I, he laughed at me when I asked why we weren't using end connectors, and I just stopped asking. So, <laughs> uh, so, so a big a big problem people have run into to date is heat. Uh, so I mentioned that before. You you put you put your test device up here, and it takes RF power, and RF power gives you a couple problems when you're running at vacuum, and you have kind of two bad choices, and so that's what uh, we're doing. Uh, with our RF connector design is trying to cut a Gordian knot and not choose between two bad choices. Bad choice number one is that you uh, keep the RF source on the thrust stand. And that's what the NASA folks did. That's, I think, what Martin's group is doing. And what that gets you is that you need to have all the waste heat that comes from the regular power to RF power conversion is also on your thrust stand. You know, 50% would be a great number, 75% losses are more common in that kind of conversion. So you're already for a 100 watt dot, uh, device center test looking at maybe 175, 200 watts that you now have to deal with on your stand when you're doing that sort of test. Um, and in vacuum, waste heat is really hard to shed, so that often is setting either your max power constraint or your operating time constraint. Uh, you know, the NASA tests, if you look at them, they're all maybe 60 seconds, they might be long, that class, it's not, certainly not 10 minutes, it's all a minute or so. And that's because their amplifiers overheat, and I think that, was that the limiting factor for you guys too in operating times? Yeah, and so I really wanted to be able to run this test at steady state. I'm used to testing hall thrusters, you know, where 30 seconds, it's not done outgassing in 30 seconds, it's not done outgassing in 30 minutes, you run it for an hour before you take your first performance measurement and you, you know, you run it overnight oftentimes uh, and you know, you'll take your measurement and get a zero just by after you're at steady state cutting power, and taking your zero, turning it back on again and that's your, you know, instant force measurement. You know, the alternative is that you can you can run at steady state if you run all of your RF power circuitry outside the chamber and have these big, heavy, bulky cables run all the way across your torsional pivot. And now you've got a pivot uh, wire that's going to heat over time. It's going to thermally expand. It's going to stretch and shift. And you know these high power RF cables, you know, they're a lot like frozen garden hoses. They, they're not very flexible. And I asked my RF guy, well, can't we use, you know, they sell nice little, like little tiny SMA cables and you can get flexible ones. It's just like, you know, you're never gonna touch the power levels you want with those kind of things. So what we looked for was a different solution. And we found one with, we really found inspiration actually with the idea of AWACS planes, you know, the airborne uh, early early monitoring and control for, for radar. You know, they've got a big thing on top uh, in those big dishes that would spin, you know, back in the 40s and 50s. And so they would have these little, you know, choke joints that were coupled and could roll around on bearings. And you could couple RF energy into a moving system because RF can hop across gaps. And, you know, we didn't go with a choke joint, but instead we went with a strip line geometry, which you see up here, which offered us some of the same opportunities. So a strip line... Could I point out that... You know, almost every comsat sitting up in geo is a seven to fifteen kilowatt system running, you know, RF uh, in a high vacuum. So, you know, you ought to be able to talk to some of your satellite guys. Uh, 
the guy doing our engineering is a satellite guy. He's the one who designs the SATCOM systems. It's just you're not measuring micronewtons of force on your satellite. You don't care if things get hot and stretch a little. I don't mind that it gets hot. That's not the problem. It's that it's all going to stretch, and it's going to be very hard for me to quantize how that shifting in the thermal profile is affecting my ability to do the measurement. Um, that's, and in particular, it's going to make it hard because as soon as I cut power, say, to do the zero, measurement, it's going to again shift my thermal profile. So steady state is going to be a unicorn. I'm never going to find it if I try to run with that setup. But yeah, I, I agree. Man managing high power, you know, when we do, you know, TVAC testing with satellite payloads in a chamber, we'll run hundreds of watts of power at up to eight gigahertz into a chamber for different test payloads. So I, I agree. That part's not the tall temple. Uh, so we went with a strip line geometry, and a strip line, if you're not familiar with it, uh, you start with a coax line, and coaxial cables don't have azimuthal currents when they support their mode in the waveguide. So you can cut axially down the coax, and it still works as far as supporting the modes. And if you deform it properly and keep the geometry right, which means asking your RF engineer to keep the geometry right, uh, you can arrive, <laughs> it's, all, it's all simulation, right? You make it look like 50 ohms, and there are rules, but you know, I, I don't do that part of the work. Uh, you can arrive at a geometry that looks like 50 ohms, but that's rectangular like this. And this by itself won't do the coupling that we want, but now we take this and we slice it in the middle. And instead of having something where you've got a strip line with these three pieces that come in, two ground planes and a center conductor, you've got fingers that will overlap. And so if you size that overlap properly, uh, such that the overlap dimensions are about lambda over four, you can get a resonant crossing of those uh, constrictions. And if you give enough overlapping area at those fingers, you can get capacitive coupling that stretches the resonance out over a wide band. And what we found is that, uh, sorry? I just, just want to make sure I understand what this kind of a joint is. is it's a non-contact, basically one side is an antenna, the other, or the transmission antenna, the other side's a receiving antenna, which is very well blossomed. <laughs> yes, basically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so one side lives on the stationary side of the yep. stand, and one side lives on the arm attached to the device. Okay. Uh, so we found that with this type of thing, and I'll show the actual system uh, on the next slide, but I mean, we needed a few square inches to extend that low end of our range to about 700 megahertz, which is the fundamental frequency for this cavity. And so this is what that actually looks like when you uh, you, you know, run all the RF simulations and get it to optimize and we've got TNC connectors on each side and we've got these narrow little gaps that are such a pain in the experiment to align uh, that are between the fingers and what you see this kind of ring shape here lets me bolt it on to a little Thorlab stage so I can do fine adjustment and get it all lined up. And this is sized for uh, high power at 2 gigahertz with um, I think this was quoted to me in DB, but I like percents a little better for radiated power. Uh, it's less than about 0.05% radiated power, which, you know, if you go to DB, that's better than 30. That's around 33, maybe, DB. Uh, so we have large ground planes. You have the symmetric structure uh, with uh, the way that the gaps are lined up. And it's better than 25 dB in terms of transmission uh, or, or reflected losses over this whole range of 700 megahertz to two and a half gigahertz. Once that with uh, that, that's the kind of you know it's a dip. That's the high ends of the dips at each end. So it's it's better. It's around 30, 35, something like that uh, at the design frequency. Uh, How big are the gaps between the plates? Uh, nominally, when I spec'd the machinist, they were ten thousandths. When they came back from the machinist, they were eight thousandths. So and you can align this with your balance. Yeah. <laughs> carefully. Very carefully. That's the part I do. So, yeah, that's, that's fun. <laughs> Something a bulky hammer won't fix. Uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not much it won't break either. <laughs> Uh, so I will note that uh, multi-pactor concerns were one of the big ones that we had to deal with with this. You've got high power, you've got tight spacings. Uh, you can be concerned about basically electron avalanche between them. Um, you know, the iridited coating that we have in our aluminum parts helped with that, um, as, as does just you know, careful finite element design and you know, sizing of the different voltages you have throughout the system. So uh, this has been tested. We've put it on our dummy load, which you see here. And we got uh, better than 20, about 23 dB uh, power across it. Uh, and that note that that's all the cabling. That's even our dummy load itself. So that's that's 
That's not a reflection of the joint being poor. That's the whole system. Uh, we ran at 100 watts in vacuum. It, it performed just fine. I'll, I'll take a moment here to note this is our dummy load. It's the only actually experimental picture I have in these slides. So we have a 200 watt bird dummy load up here. Uh, it's sitting on just an aluminum block. And then it's got these, I call it the X-wing. It's got these big black aluminum anodized fins. Those are radiator fins. And the idea is it should be able to run at 100 watts and not get hotter than 100 degrees C in vacuum. It'll radiate properly. So there's some thermal grease in between the aluminum block and both the load and these fins. Uh, you can also see some foil heaters on here that let us resistively heat it so we can preheat to a steady state oops, temperature before we turn on the RF power. So that, that's an approach that we actually are using with the cavity as well. So uh, on the multi-partor uh, dis discharge uh, concern, um, I take a skeptical view of far of the EM drive being a real thruster, but uh, let's say for if you are agnostic and consider, well, it may be real. And if it is real, then it is maybe due to the multi-factor effect. By mitigating it, then you're going to end up having uh, no thrust. Well, I just don't want multi-factor in my joint. It can multi-pact in the cavity all it wants, if okay. it wants to. Right. I mean, I, I don't think it will, but... Well, yeah. actually, NASA said that they, they did see these charges in a number of experiments. So we monitor whether or not we should have any multi-paction during our tests uh, through uh, kind of it's kind of a, a crude but effective circuit that our RF engineer put together. And the idea is that we're putting in a fundamental frequency at you know 1.8 gigahertz. But if we have multi-paction, that should be this big disruptive sudden event that would introduce broad spectrum noise into the discharge. And so he notches out our uh, fundamental and then monitors the second harmonic, and we leave that in persistence mode on a it's not a network analyzer, it's a spectrum analyzer. And you know, basically watch and you know, we, we ramp up power very slowly and we get to steady state. And we just want to see, you know, does that ever peak and peg somewhere high, which would indicate some sporadic multi-paction event. And from what he tells me, that's proved effective in his past testing, looking for multi-paction in RF devices at high power and in vacuum. And so we haven't seen any of those types of spikes. So we don't think we're having multi-paction. Uh, either in the finger joint or in the cavity, which we've... The ca so you have uh, electromagnetic uh, closed resonant cavities and you have not seen multi-paction effect because they have seen it very often since what we're doing in, in resonant cavity for... I, I, I'm not arguing you can't do it. I'm just saying we have tried not to do it. Okay. And so we've, in our operating mode for, this is our resonant cavity, and our operating modes for that resonant cavity up to 100 watts we do not see the signals in the spectrum that would be characteristic of a multi-pactor discharge. Okay, but let's, let's look, for example, at the resonant cavity for particle accelerator, right? Why? And, no, because uh, those were the original resonant cavities, and they do work in the gigahertz range, and they, find, they found the, the multi-pactor effect being detrimental to, to their experiments. So they have tried since then to mitigate it, right? So what I'm saying is, the, in the experiment that, that NASA has done, they have found these charges, and also some other experiment they have found these charges. Actually, has this one I know where they claim to say, oh, they saw a big, big force that was related to a discharge. So I expect where you're going with this is, can you cause a multi-factor discharge and show it would make force? And that, that to me is, is like step two, or step, step n plus one, where and, and the first one you want to do is, can you just do a measurement without multi-pactor discharges? Can you arrive at zero? And I, I would expect, and kind of my goal here is to set up our experiments so I fully expect to see zero when we turn everything on. And at that point, you can say, you know, check. We, we thought we should get zero. We got zero. We're happy. We have a symmetric system. We put harmonic fields in, zero thrust, as you might expect. And now, can we reintroduce you know, perturbing factors that might mimic the types of things that have happened so far. At that, that point, you have an open and shut case. We can remove the effect or we can cause an on-command. Okay. But, but first, first, I want to take out all the other gotcha. usual suspects. Uh, so, so, so this is our joint. This is our, uh, this is our dummy load. And uh, we did testing on this at vacuum that left us pretty happy with the performance of the system. Aside from the hair-raising, nerve-wracking process of actually aligning it. Um, so, so moving forward, designing this with a little bit bigger gaps, I think, is going to be important. Uh, so this is what this system will look like on our thrust stand uh, as implemented with today's, um, today's setup. So 
This is a picture of the cavity itself. Uh, this is the cavity from the side. And then this is showing the, the dummy load uh, from the side as well, again, just for scale. And I'll note that I mentioned that this non-contact joint is intended to fit into a little Thorlabs motion stage. So it's a five degree of freedom stage. You can do a very careful little micron, micron adjustment of everything. And uh, that lives on this mezzanine level, which is just right on the uh, chamber bre uh, thrust and breadboard. Uh, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Uh, this also lets you see the mechanism that allows free motion. So this arm is going to move with the cavity in and out of the page, but the alignment plane is horizontal, parallel to the baseboard. So the cavity can swing freely back and forth like this while the fingers sit there on the stationary side. And what this lets us do is it lets us keep all that waste heat out in our 19 inch rack mount power amplifier outside the chamber. So we're going to lose a fair amount of power in the cabling getting up to the thrust stand, but we don't care. You, know, you just calibrate that out. You know? So we have a 150 watt amplifier. It might only top out at 120 watts by the time we get to the cavity. But you measure insertion loss for every component in, in the line, and you accept that those things get hot, and you heat, heat sink them properly, and you just take your measurement uh, on the thrust stand itself. And that's, that's the way we run the experiment. So our power meters have those calibrations built in. So when we query power, we're recording the cavity power we've already calibrated as reaching the cavity. Uh, so the last thing I was going to talk about before I show just a couple of results is our feedback control circuit. Uh, feedback control turns out to be really important because we're running essentially a big heater. And that heater is, as heaters tend to do, it's getting hot. And those hot things expand. And we have a cavity whose resonant frequency is dictated by its size. So it gets hotter, uh, it expands, its resonant wavelength increases to correspond to the increased size, the frequency drops. And in particular for aluminum, which is our material, uh, it expands, it's like 2 times 10 to the minus 5 per degree C. So now it's going to get 100 degrees C hot. So you're looking at uh, several thousandths of an inch longer that it's going to get. But the even better way to think about that is that uh, Jose pointed out earlier that the resonant bandwidth for one of these cavities gets tighter as your Q gets higher. So with a 16,000 Q cavity, we have to stay accurate to one part in 16,000 on the resonant frequency. And so aluminum will expand enough, I think it's actually every three degrees C, not every five, to drive itself off resonance if we were to supply that with a fixed frequency source. So instead we monitor that uh, the reflected power from our system in a little closed feedback loop uh, at a few hertz and adjust that resonant frequency with a simple dither technique. So measure reflected power, step, is it worse? Step back, is it better? Keep stepping that way. And uh, that just runs off a little couple hundred buck um, analog I.O. board running into LabVIEW. Uh, it does this feedback loop and then we use a signal generator. This is a um, solid state synthesizer. Uh, I have the model number in our paper that we put at the conference recently. can't remember it offhand. Uh, that runs through a directional coupler that lets us take off the reflected power, attenuate it as needed, goes to the 150 watt amplifier, and then you know, there's some actual vacuum feed throughs here and then the cavity itself. So we implement it in our LabVIEW control loop. LabVIEW runs at a kilohertz, but as I said, it's really taking a lot of averaging over that time. It's only running at a few hertz for adjusting the uh, frequency. We do a coarse initial tuning, just a sweep through all frequencies at about plus or minus one megahertz. We find the resonant peak and we live at it. So we don't try to force it to be at a resonant frequency. We just follow it. Uh, and that converges to near zero reflected power in under a second. I mean, it's fine. You turn it on, it's on resonance by the time you blink. I don't think I've noted too much about mode identification to this point. And so it's not in the slides, but I'll just talk to it directly. Uh, there's some concern that you want to know you're on the same mode as, as other people are testing these cavities. Some people have done this through thermal imaging to look for hot spots. Um, we approach this mostly analytically and numerically to date. So we started off, my, my RF engineer uses FICO software to do the RF computations. We started off modeling a nice spherical end-capped geometry of these cavities, which is good because it's analytically tractable, so you can get the full analytic solutions for all the resonant frequencies and what each one is a TE or TM. You said that you're using FICO? Yeah. F-E-K-O? Yeah, Altair. Uh, yeah. Are you planning to use um, uh, dielectrics inside? The we 
Because if you do, we'll use that. We will. We will put a dielectric inside uh, next. If you do, uh, Fico has a problem with the uh, uh, currents at the boundary conditions for the dielectric. If you look at it, and it's not well publicized, they are using the what's known as the Huygens principle. Okay. And uh, it would be a good idea if um, you have, if you have console or another program to that has a different computational approach to, to look at it. Anyway, like you were saying before, uh, when you look at the at the, what FICO's outputting and see whether it makes sense. Like you said, you cannot have any charges, for example. You yeah. don't have any charges. But if you show you something funny going on in the dielectric, it is it's a problem with FICO and not the real same. Uh, just one question. You measure your reflective power for your power and stuff. Uh, is that true? It's such a mess in the rack. I'm having trouble tracing through the experiment. It, I see what you're saying, that seems odd, right? But I can't be sure with the way that we've got the different, there's actually some power dividers in there too, so we have copies of each signal, and so I'm, I still think this is true though. I think that, no, actually, no, we have so many attenuators, I think it has to be after the power amplifier that we're monitoring the reflected power, so I think, I think that might be an error there. So, thank you. Yeah, so, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna do any, any thermal imaging or whatnot to, to be sure you're on the right mode. You're just going to trust your, your software analysis results. So I was, yeah, you say that, that sounds very bad. Yeah. So let me, let me elaborate. <laughs> So let me, let, me, let me finish that, that train of thought, and then I'll tell you why we felt pretty good so far with how things were working. So we, we analytically solved for what the resonant modes should be in a spherical end cap geometry where it's analytically tractable. We simulated those modes in FICO with different orientations of our loop to be able to excite the TE and the TM. That matched up very well with the analytical model. We shifted to the experimental model that we had as fabricated and simulated that in FICO and got its spectrum of you know, dips in the resonant peaks. And we actually took a network analyzer with our cavity and swept through with those two different orientations. And that again matched up to you know, like within the half width of the resonant peaks. So we felt pretty good that we had identified which peaks were which based on that. And then we felt confident that since there was such a small shift between the two from the spherical to the flat, uh, compared to the shifts between each mode, these shifts between those spherical versus flat were very small. We felt reasonably confident that we had identified uh, the right, whether it's TE or TM in which mode it is. And then finally, within FICO, you can go and actually take cross sections and see where the energy is and what the field strengths are through the system. And it, it matched up again with what you'd expect. Is this a TM212 mode? You have these little rings in different spots and it, it looked good. So based on all that, we felt like we're probably exciting the right mode that we think we should. So we, we might not thermally image it, but a, as you s will see, you know, it's, it's not clear given how thick our metal is that we'd see anything anyway. <laughs> you know, it's not like a PCB board where the heat's gonna stay in one spot. It's gonna wick all through the system. If I could tell a quick story, I was uh, on a failure review board where our team had designed a new nozzle for a solid rock booster. They did it all in software, lots of different yeah, sets of software. They checked everything, everything matched up. It showed that the seal was supposed to close up and uh, everything would work perfectly. The first time they fired the engine, they blew the nozzle off in one second. And that's because the uh, seal opened up instead of closing up. So, good luck. The important thing about sign errors is really to make an even number of them. That's what I find. One question. Did, did you match any frequency, or did you just design your antenna properly, or did you use a tuner or something? I'm sorry. Did you use a tuner for matching the frequency, or just did you uh, did you just uh, design your antenna in the right way, or did you? Any you mean to land where the resonant frequency is? It was at 1.9 gigahertz. Yeah. Uh, we we sized the cavity to the NASA dimensions, and so that that ends up putting your resonant frequency. Okay, but no uh, tuning to this 50 ohm uh, impedance of the waveguides into the cavity. 
all there, there's no well there's no wave guys it's all it's all coaxial cable i mean which which might be semantic right but so all those you know we're using 50 ohm cables coming in the, the strip line finger joint connector is designed to be 50 ohms as well when you're going with your 50 ohm cables to your cavity to your uh, emitter antenna in your cavity and then once we get to the actual antenna in the cavity the diameter of the loop inside is what gets tuned so that's a, that's adjustable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that that's where the final yeah. How does how does it make the cavity itself look like 50 ohm is is that? So there's a little, it's it's basically a mechanical connection. So we got the thing coupled around, and then there's a little screw you can adjust to pull out a length of copper to make the loop longer. But you you can model with FICO placing the antennas at different places, and you're going to see that you by placing the antenna at different places you will excite different modes and actually you can show that analytically the, the ones that are very difficult to excite are the TE modes they are more difficult to excite than the TM modes yeah that's that's part of the placing uh, for the the RF feed on this um, I don't think I have a vertically oriented but this is it's maybe an inch and a half or so again the exact dimension was, was in our paper from our conference but uh, mm -hmm. But it's it's sized to be in a spot where it can get to both modes. Um, yeah, there's there's kind of pathological spots where you can miss one because right. you're in a null, right. and this can get to most of them depending on which way you turn it. The, and, and the Q won't be the same for all of them; it won't couple as efficiently, right. um, but it'll be good enough. Um, but up above, so. So yeah, what are we actually going to do with all this stuff? So our goals are to run at forward power levels greater than 80 watts at thermal steady state and uh, to identify both thermal drift and any potential outgassing thrust effects from this. Uh, so to reduce our thermal load, we've got our RF source outside the vacuum chamber coming to this finger joint. Uh, to reduce our thermal drift, we're using this non-contact connection so that we can get away from the cable, RF cable causing us drift. Uh, we're also stabilizing the base plate of the cavity with heaters. These are just little thin foil heaters, so we can run at about 50 C on the base plate. This is an idea borrowed from capacitance manometers, pressure gauges, that, and really many pieces of sensitive electronics that run more stably when you heat them up to some temperature and then you can adjust up and down, as opposed to ambient temperature where you can't really cool with a heater. You want to live somewhere hotter. Uh, we are going to be both pre and post heating the cavity uh, with heaters on the cavity as well. That lets us match our thermal profile approximately such that we can heat the cavity with DC or actually AC heaters. We can heat with RF, we can go back to AC and reduce the thermal transients from the RF turn on. Uh, we operate on RF power to thermal steady state uh, before that lets us calibrate how much AC heating we need to match it. Uh, and then we use a solid state relay on the stand to short those resistive heaters during RF operation so that we have the same amount of AC current running across the torsional pivot through those wires at all times. And that accounts for any thermal drift due to heating in those wires themselves. So the only, this is all, the heating is all AC. The only DC currents we have on here are the relay actuating current, which is a few milliamps. Uh, and whatever we need for the stepper motors, which usually aren't in actuation. I did note your s comment of those being a noise source, though, and I want to go check that now and find out. Uh, to monitor RF effects, we'll be testing first with our dummy load in the non-contact joint at similar RF powers and temperatures, uh, looking for any spurious effects just due to the RF effect. We'll be testing the cavity first without the polymer insert, as I think is just another control. I don't think anyone claims it's supposed to actually do anything without the plastic in there. Um, but just again to get another baseline and then ultimately we'll test the cavity with the plastic insert in and a full IV and V of what NASA Johnson reported. So that is about all of our experimental setup. I'll actually give some kind of basic results now. So when we first tested this cavity, the emissivity of copper plating like this is around 0.06 or so. And that means that you run at 10 watts and you're already at 100 C at steady state. And that it takes quite a long time to get there. Uh, but we wanted to be able to run at these 100 watt class power levels at 100 C. That's kind of a self-imposed temperature limit for us based on the acrylic adhesive in these heaters. And so we coated the entire thing with a high emissivity graphite paint. Uh, that increased our emissivity up to about 0.8 and lets us get up above 80 watts without getting over 100 C. Uh, this is a some thermal profiling we did of that under 
I think this actually is under DC heating, but we'll run this on AC during the testing uh, with thermocouples at points one, two, three, four, and on our relay at five. And uh, red, yellow, green, uh, orange, and green are one, two, three, four, and then blue is thermocouple five. This is temperature on this axis as well as power in black. So you can see we went up to about, uh, looks like 85, maybe almost 90 watts of power here. And this is in hours over about two hours, we arrived at about 100, 100 degrees C. And we turn off and cool off. So things to take from this are thermal equilibration times are of order hours, even with the high emissivity coating. And you have an approximately 30 degrees C spread across the body of this cavity uh, when you're running at full power uh, with the heaters. When we switch over to RF heating of the cavity, uh, that matched about 85 watt power level takes us to only 90 watts at the hottest temperature and about 78 at the coolest with uh, this, blue, this blue thermocouple trace now being actually our RF cable instead of a relay. Now is to make sure our cables weren't going to be overheating. And so we dropped from a 30 degree spread with AC heating to about a 12 degree spread with RF. Fortunately, the mean uh, was relatively comparable between those two. So we're hoping that we'll get, if not a canceled, at least a vastly reduced temperature delta when we switch from preheating to active RF heating and back. Where's the uh, large end line on this one? The black one? No, the T2. T1 is, oh, it's, it's, it's in there. They're all, it, buried the, in there? yeah, the orange is buried behind the uh, yellow and green. Um, when I'm looking at that in particular, it looks like you have a pretty big thermal mass around the, the large flange with all those bolts. Mm -hmm. um, is that intentional? Like by design with all those little... All those bolts are basically for uniform clamping force. So we wanted to get a really nice tight joint there so RF currents won't have any trouble hopping across the gap from base to lid. Uh, as far as therm extra thermal mass there, um, I hadn't thought about it that way because at steady state, we don't care about the transient through the thermal mass. We care about more where the leaving sources are. So the radiative surface area there shouldn't be that different from having a big thick flange connection versus just having a really thin, elegant little corner. Um, it, it is interesting that you get such a big delta from the center to the edge there. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I think that's, that's partly because that's kind of like the most isolated spot in terms of conducting to the rest of the device. We, I feel like I've seen some profiles that not a lot of heating happens from RF at the small end. There's just not much field strength there. So you exp and that's why we put the heaters primarily on the big plate and then on the edge. Uh, but we, we didn't exhaustively match the heating profiles here. These were stock heaters that we had in-house. Um, so, so we still have, uh, a, a, we have a slightly longer equilibration time here, but still of order hours. And more importantly, this is zero to 14 hours. So we have really long-term stable frequency matching. So we feel like we can, we can run this thing all day if we want to. Uh, so, so last, that, that's kind of all the data and stuff I was presenting within these slides. I was going to stop and comment just on a couple of the big errors that I expect we're going to have to deal with. The big one's thermal. And just quantitatively, we talked about this device, you know, expanding by, you know, like a part in Q every three degrees C, so a part in 16,000. So at 100 degrees C type changes, you know, you're talking about, you know, let's do math in our head. It's, you know, it's of order hundreds of microns that this thing shifts because it's so big. You know, we're only measuring displacements due to maybe a few hundred micronewtons force of tens of microns. So that is a big signal to noise problem. You know, you, we've upgraded our flexures a little bit to improve our thrust and sensitivity, but that really is what drives all the preheating is we're hoping to get as much of that thermal expansion out of the way as we can before we turn on the RF power to take thrust measurements. Another big question I think we should all ask is at a fundamental level, it's, it's very fuzzy why we should put harmonic fields, you know, based sines and cosines into a device and expect a net force going one way coming out. You know, so looking for the rectifying effect there. And I, I struggled for a long time to think of rectifying effects in this configuration. And one that I finally arrived at is actually electrostriction, which as many of you know from the mock effect stuff is, is an E squared. You know, you put a field on a material and the charges separate and expands, and you switch the field direction, it still expands. It's always getting longer. So running at a gigahertz, you really don't often think of 
that affecting a material, because electrostriction is an ion phenomenon. As a plasma person, it's the difference between ion frequencies and electron frequencies. Uh, but looking through the literature on this, what you find is that there is literature looking at using beat frequencies in dielectrics as something that can give you electrostrictive responses. So if you have a source in the gigahertz and a nearby source also in the gigahertz but within 100 kilohertz where electrostriction is active, that beat frequency of the difference between those two can excite electrostrictive responses. And this has actually been used as a really sensitive uh, radio receiver uh, with fiber optic cables where you excite the electrostrictive response. There's some work at NRL that I found. So you could see with a uh, a power amplifier in the RF that's going to have side bands. Uh, you know, our resonant uh, bandwidth for our device is wide enough to accommodate things within about 50 kilohertz or so. So we could actually have a device coupling with its own side bands to make electrostrictive responses. You stretch the dielectric and you shift the CG the same way you do from the thermal effects. And so once I get rid of the thermal problems, that's one of the next things I actually want to look at. You could get at that experimentally in a variety of ways, but maybe the easiest one is just in a cylindrical resonant cavity instead. You look at what the effect would be. So uh, the last one is outgassing. Outgassing, I'll just comment, is the one that I feel pretty conclusively we can put a nail in the coffin. We, we've done some math, and I put it in our paper that you know, the types of fluxes of gas you would need to get a resist eject kind of effect from outgassing out of these devices would be associated with pressure spikes of order millitor that would be glaringly evident on your pressure gauges in your system. So I don't think that outgassing is something we're going to have to look at as an effect. Uh, so in summary, uh, we're engaged in this IV and V effort uh, looking at anomalous thrust production and resonant microwave cavities. Uh, we called these impulse drives mainly to emphasize the fact that we're agnostic on the physical mechanism at play, if any, aside from experimental error. Uh, we've cal we fabricated our cavity with a high Q. Uh, we anticipate our power levels at about 100 watts uh, to begin testing. We developed this non-contact power transmission joint, the finger joint. Uh, we anticipate testing at thermal steady state uh, with the RF source outside the chamber with these resistive heaters that preheat us to equilibrium before we turn on the RF. Uh, just as I left for this event here, I'd finally gotten our dummy load on the thrust stand after these initial thermal checkouts on stationary platforms and hope to test that very soon. So uh, thank you for your time. Sure. What's the time frame to begin testing? Yeah, you ask an experimentalist that, and my feeling is that I've gotten it wrong so many times, uh, <laughs> estimating I'd already be, I was going to be done by now uh, when I started last October. Remember? Uh, so yeah, I, I try these factors now. <laughs> um, so my answer to that is that I'm in no rush to be first to the wrong answer. Uh, so I'm moving with all deliberate speed, I think, in a rosy scenario where everything went according to plan. That could be of order very few months, uh, but in the real world, you know, pick your multiplication factor. Sorry, I, sorry, I can't be more clear. My, my management also wishes I could answer that oh, question. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and will you be able to publicly publish your results? Oh, I, I, I anticipate that we would actually go directly to a follow-up journal article on JPP with the results. Um, I think that, honestly, I would even putting our best efforts into getting good results, I want peer review before I would put them out publicly to get, you know, help people figure out where the bodies are buried, you know, make sure we answer all the questions. Yeah, right. yeah the, uh, the workshop we had last year was, I think, just after the paper was published, right? Is that right? No, it was before. It was just before or just after, because George Hathaway came in and laid out that laundry list of things that the paper didn't include. Well, the paper was in December. Okay, so maybe it was the draft. Yeah. All right, but that's... One of the things I wanted to mention is that you know we had another person at the lab, at the workshop last year that laid out a I don't know it was a 75 or 100 page presentation about all the things that they didn't <clears throat> excuse me they didn't consider at in, down at NASA when they did their work and all the different you know like you said bodies that could be buried you know that they had to consider or they should have considered or didn't have time to consider but that will probably be a helpful reference to you. I, 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 Always have just to, to go through more and, you know, act as a checklist of things that you have done or have taken care of or that you need to do or you don't time or time or money to do. Yeah, yeah I was telling someone earlier, you know, medical school they tell doctors think horses, not zebras, when they hear symptoms, right? Yeah. You know, and so with this one, uh, look for the common 
potential causes, the really basic physics stuff. And you know, to me, thermal is, is the biggest force in the room there. And but once I get that one taken care of, yeah, I think it's it's a matter of looking at that tree of all those different options and trying to pick your most likely ones and just right. whack them all one by one. And then at the end, you know, you feel pretty confident in your data and you can start looking at it if merited as a source for, you know, new theories. Dick's suggestion I think is a very good one. Uh, that was a very exhaustive paper last year on sources of experimental errors. I don't, I don't know if he wrote the paper, or did, he just, did, he, did George Hathaway write the paper, a paper, or did he just present it? Exactly, he gave me a PowerPoint and, and the paper materialized from the PowerPoint. Okay, yeah, because I can, I can send that information. Yeah, to I, mean, I, think, I think I still have that at some point. Well, it's, George, are, are the PowerPoints on SSI? I think so. Well, the, the Estes Park the, Proceedings is on Estes Park. This paper is on your, yeah. your yeah. website. Yeah, so you okay. can just go to the video. Yeah. You, you can get yeah, the entire book. Because we couldn't look, we couldn't show George's face. So basically, you're look, he's doing voiceover for his very long presentation. Yeah, it was long. <laughs> it was long, yes. I think everyone knew it, it was long. Yeah, it was long. That's how many things he found. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it would be a good reference for you just to take a look at yeah. but, but if you make enough thrust, it doesn't matter how. Yeah, there is there's some virtue, you know. That's right. <laughs> bang, you know, bang it hard. <laughs> so, to, to be fair, with other things that make a lot of thrust, we, we we trust the physical mechanism a lot more, so we're not as skeptical, you know. And so it's big thrust by itself, it helps, but it doesn't solve the problem. But but if you pulse with a lot of power, pulsing scares me more. Well, yeah, but you might drive. You might avoid some of the thermal issues, you know, just because like I mean, you can look at the thrust, it goes up, and then you can see the, the thermal error catch up. So you might be able to avoid. Yeah, go, yeah, go yeah. slow enough that it's zero, or you go fast I, enough that you know, it, I just want to push the throttle to the wall. Yeah, right to a button, right? Yeah. So how how easy is it? How easy is it on your with your device and your test stand to reverse, like mount it the other way? You know, physically do things to. You know, look so you, you can do that. I mean, there's there's nothing with the way the joint's set up. You know, you just you take it and turn the dummy load around. Um, you know, or here, sorry, you gotta turn the whole dummy load around or. You rotate the cavity so that the feed would be pointing still radially inward to uh, to do it. You, I wouldn't have to break vacuum. You know, I don't have a little motion oh, yeah. stage like Martin did. But honestly, that, that scares me too. I looked, I'm like, oh, you have more motion stages. I hope it's all perfectly aligned and it doesn't tilt a little on you. You know, so it's all what you fear is all in your experience, right? You know? Sure. Uh, but we, I think, assuming that it's not a zero measurement, that yeah, then you look at. Reversing direction and right. seeing if it follows all these null procedures. Right. But your stand and your and the design of your device are such that you can do that without any yeah, major yeah. So when you were looking at the discussing the physical mechanism and you discussed dielectric, uh, the, the electrostriction, were you considering the electrostriction in the dielectric? Yeah, I was considering the dielectric as a thing that might stretch a little bit, a tiny bit, and then. But the, the, the food for thought there is the problem is that Scheuer himself, the first experiments and the first patents were with a dielectric insert, and then he removed it, saying that. Without the dielectric, he got much bigger forces. And then NASA also started with the dielectric, and then, much to my surprise, uh, Paul Marx said they, they remove it and they, and they got even bigger forces. So that. So, start so, with so the dielectric, then say, take it out. So, what we have to say that. Uh, Ultimately, the pattern, you, know, you, have to, you, have to pick, you have to pick your sources. I went with stuff that had gone through peer review. Uh, so I was happy to take what they put in JPP and test that. Uh -huh. And for now, that's that's my mandate is to really nail that down. And at that point, I'll I'll happily consider you know expanding scope to other configurations. But well, it would be fairly easy for you to take the dielectric out. I mean, I, I, I know that that's the first. I'm not putting it in at first. It's not in there. So we'll test empty and then we'll put it in. Uh, yeah, I I expect to see zero without it in there. And I, Fact, maybe it'll stretch a little and maybe give some signal when it's in. Maybe it'll all push, you know, maybe I don't have to work on all thrusters anymore. That'd you know, be great. You know, cryo pumps are a pain in chambers. If you can run a thruster and not have reaction mass, you know, with, with all seriousness, that the ground testing benefits alone would be astronomical. You know, when you ask people whether this is, this is real or not, uh, people ask me that plenty of times. You know, my answer is usually, well, the odds are you know, somewhere between one and 10, 
and one in 10 million. So pick your order of magnitude. But at the same time, many high risk areas of research are very improbable that they'll make it big. This is one of very few that I've ever seen where the payoffs are such that even on the upper end of that, it's still something that you should look into. And ultimately, that's one of the roles of a government research lab is to look at stuff that's far out and risky enough that it doesn't make sense in a private money-making capacity to evaluate. So opportunity cost, if you have a one in a 10 million shot at a 10 billion payoff, you, know, you should keep buying that lottery ticket as long as you're solvent. How big a signal are you looking for? Uh, supposing you have a micro-newton. Um, so any thruster should scale such that more power makes more thrust, right? That should at least be positive. Uh, and they gave a, a order micro-newton per watt number in NASA's paper. I've seen, the best I've seen is that it's maybe linear with Q and we're running at twice the Q. Uh, so they saw a steady state of 90 micronewtons. At twice the Q, we then see at the same power 180 micronewtons. And then if we boost power a little bit with our existing amplifier, you get up into the low 200-ish micronewtons. Uh, it would, we're at about 120 watts or so, uh -huh. assuming it's scaled all the same way. So our noise is down at a few single micronewtons, so you could conceivably get very high signal noise ratios there. Uh, you know, that's, that's very specula speculative, right? I haven't done the measurement. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing that uh, uh, that Heidi and, and Jim have found is it scales as the voltage to the fourth power, which means power squared. So that's a different theory, right? A different class of device for those little stacks of, of piezoelectrics. Yeah, but still, um, maybe you want to comment on that. I got an email from Heidi saying anything that goes as the power might be a thermal effect. But if it goes as piezoelectrics, power squared could not be a thermal effect. Do you want to comment on that, uh, Heidi? Yeah. Um, I, do, I do think that the EM drive may be a different theory to the mega drive. I'm not sure, but I mean, Jean-Philippe this morning, uh, he was thinking that maybe they're related, but um, I honestly know, I'm not sure. You know, even if it's quadratic, you know, as you're saying, you know, there's, there's plenty of shallow quadratics that look linear with an error bars. I'm not, I'm not positive without the data we'd be able to distinguish, but you know, certainly you put it on a semi-log plot and you look for different slopes and you can try to pull out a power dependence. Right. That, 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 I think it's uh, very important. But, but, then, uh, but, but again, the, the, the people that have run the experiments uh, and in the literature claim that the force they measure was uh, proportional to the voltage square, not to the voltage to the fourth power. That is all of them. That means Scheuer, that means NASA, that means uh, the Chinese, etc. Then it will be even bigger and even easier to measure. Great. <laughs> As I said, I'm agnostic about the theories. I don't swim in those waters. I, I test things. Why the EM drive instead of the Woodward style mock effect professor? Because uh, there was a you know, recent high profile peer reviewed paper and we were getting a lot of questions about it. Uh, yeah, so it, it's long and short of it. Also, I would, I would actually say that our expertise, you know, for designing a RF feed system and for doing, you know, torsional thrust at the, uh, you know, several tens to hundreds of micronewtons, that's a case where that was much more, I'd say, in our wheelhouse than you know, these, you know, it looks like much smaller, kind of single micronewton forces. I think I would really struggle to get a credible measurement at that level. Yeah, it's below and your noise. It's below your noise. No. It's below your noise floor. Yeah, and uh, you know, and there's also probably some expertise with the type of PZT right. you know, materials that you know, maybe some acoustics people at NRL would be able to handle, but certainly not within the spacecraft division that we don't deal with. So, you know, really high profile uh, within our wheelhouse, and nothing in this precludes us. We're going to. It's a beautiful thing about measuring something that seems like it ought to be zero to the nth degree is you get a really great test facility out of it. And that's the flip side of that opportunity cost I mentioned. We're looking at 
RF high power systems that generate low thrust. You know, so when you look at RF power and the plasma propulsion side, you get nice benefits on ion production costs for making plasmas and being able to accelerate them. So a lot of new small satellite propulsion systems look at RF sources to make the plasma before, either in a first stage before accelerating with DC or using thermal acceleration. And all the stuff that we're doing here uh, really transfers well over to those more conventional inquiries too. Thank the speaker again. Yeah.